Okay. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome back to the MIT Category Seminar. Uh, I'm Brendan Fong, and today I'm sharing because our, our usual chair, uh, Paolo Porto, is speaking. So, um, without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Paolo. Thanks for speaking today. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome, everybody. So today I'm going to talk about CAN extensions and I may give maybe the first example of a pure categorical construction that's motivated by probability. It could be the first time that this happens. Anyway, I usually do probability theory. I mean, using category theory, this time it's going to be more abstract than usual, all right? So what's the basic idea? Imagine that you have a CAN extension diagram where by CAN extension here, I will always mean point-wise CAN extensions. So the idea you have a category, another category, some functors, and you want to take the left CAN extension. Suppose for example, that category A looks like this. This, let's see. And then the functor G to this category, well, kind of identifies. Maybe let's first see what happened in C. So F will map this category to something of a similar shape, but inside C, so this is C. B will map this category, sorry, B is like this, so the, the can extension will map this to something that looks like this. Now what I want to say is that if G, let's say identifies this entire sub diagram into this point, and this sub diagram into this point, then what happens at the can extension level is that the point down here that's replacing the diagram happens to be the co-limit. So of course this, this natural transformation would give a co-cone, this co-cone is universal and it happens to be exactly the co-limit of this part of the diagram. Now this happens in only in the nicest cases of can extension, otherwise it's a bit more complicated than this. So let's try to understand what, it, what, what this means, how this happens and when this happens, okay? So let's make this systematic. So I'm going to use a theory of partial evaluations, which I explained in my previous talk and in a couple of other talks. But of course, if you want to add, uh, ask questions about this, maybe later, feel free to. So what's the idea of partial evaluations? So take a monad. Let's do it on set. Take an algebra. So as an example, suppose you take the free commutative monoid monad. And take as an algebra natural numbers with addition. Okay. Then given some P and Q in TA, we say that P and Q are connected by a partial evaluation if we have R in TTA, 
such that mu of r is p and t e of r is q. So let me see what I mean. So then you have tti here, you have ti here. So p and q live in here. Now there's two possible ways of going from here to here, okay? So there's the multiplication of the monad and there's T applied to the structure map of the algebra. In the case of the free commutative monoid model, what we're saying is that this, considered as a formal expression, it's the formal sum of real numbers, this is in TA, can be partially evaluated to this. Why? Because there's a, an element of TTA, a nested formal expression, so a term of terms, if you want, that contains as the first term, a formal sum, and the second term, another formal sum. And now mu removes the parentheses, and TE evaluates inside each box, okay? But for those of you that like higher category theory or homotopy theory, there's also a one-line definition of partial evaluation. Hmm. So partial evaluations are the one simplices of the bar construction. So you know that there's a simplicial set TA, TTA, and so on. And the source and target maps, if you want, are exactly those two maps, mu and TE. Okay? All right, so that's what partial evaluations are. And the idea you see, this is like the sum is, is evaluated only partially. You don't, you don't get to the total result. So I want to argue that in some sense, can extensions do this, but for co-limits instead of sums? All right, so first of all, how do we modify this idea? So we have to go to categories. So first of all, we don't take set, we take cat. Now let me say, we're talking about co-limits, so you can imagine that all this is scattered with size issues. We have to be very, very careful. So cat, all capitalized are locally small categories but possibly large. And cat like this is small categories. Okay? So be careful that both these things are true. Cat is in cat because it is a local small category, but what is also true is that cat is a subcategory, full subcategory of cat, okay? Now, we have to make this a bit higher. So technically we want a pseudo monad. Here we want a pseudo algebra. I will just say monad and algebra from now on, but they are suitably pseudo. Given P and Q and TA, we say P and, T, P and Q are connected by a partial evaluation. If you have something in here such that we have isomorphisms in here, okay? Now maybe first question to the community, we don't have a simplicial set anymore down here because now the simplicial identities only hold up to coherent isomorphism. What is this object? It's not technically a simplicial set, it's something a bit weaker. Maybe somebody in the community knows what this is. I, uh, I already talked to some of you, but uh, I never went uh, deeply into answering this question, but there is something that looks a bit like simplicial set, just higher. I wonder what that is, all right? But so here's the definition of partial evaluations that we may want to use. And now, so the monads that are interest, of interest to us, the monads that we really want to use, are going to be Are, they are pseudo monads, but let me just call them monads. 
The first one is a monad of diagrams. One cat. I didn't invent this monad. This monad was, as far as I know, invented by Guitart. So it was in this paper called, well, on the functor of diagrams or something like that, on the diagram functor. There are not all the coherences explicitly proven in this paper, but uh, the first idea of that monad came in here. And the second monad that I want to study is a monad of smoke receives. Again on cat. And as far as I know, it disappeared first in Steve Lack and Brian May. Limits of small functors. That's in the Journal of Beautiful Apply Algebra in. 2007. Okay, so I didn't invent those monads. I just related the two and for the first case, so did some of their algebras. And of course, then done all this partial evaluation business. Okay, so let's start. Can you say yes. more precisely the definition of the monad of diagrams? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to say it right now. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this is actually, when I first discovered this, I was quite excited because nobody had ever told me that monads, that, that diagrams form a monad. It's like, I was like, I've been studying category theory for years and I didn't know that you can make a monad of diagrams and that co-complete algebras are, are, uh, are algebras. So let's see what this is like. First of all, again, we have to be a bit careful with size issues. So, Let's see, be locally small, okay? A diagram in C is a functor from I, D to C, I for indexing, where I is small, okay? We only want small diagrams. The idea is that we want the, only those diagrams that can have a co-limit in a sensible way. I mean, in a sensible way, in a way that doesn't break things in general. But most importantly, so a morphism of diagrams consists of, so we have diagrams I and J, E, so I and J are small, consists of, first of all, a functor here, R from I to J, but also a natural transformation here, okay? So now, this is a bit similar to the morphism of diagrams as natural transformations of functors, but be careful, there's a little difference in that R may be not Essentially, it's subjective in general. So if you have a diagram in C, then a morphism of diagram may, of course, I don't know, um, map into a new diagram that potentially identifies two objects, a bit like in the usual case, but there may be more stuff in the new diagram, okay? So it's not just a deformation of a diagram, it's the deformation into 
a new diagram that may have some more stuff. Okay. If you want, these are elements of like some sli uh, lax slice category. So that's basically, so these are small categories of cat over C, but lax. Okay, or of lax, I, I hope. Of lax maybe, one of the two. Okay, so these diagrams, these diagrams here, these triangles don't have to connect. Okay, so how is this functorial? Maybe let's just do it here. How is this functorial? Well, if you have a functor from C to D, where D is again locally small, then you just do this, just glue. So you can go from, if you have functor like this, then you get from diagrams in C to diagram in C. You get just post composition with F. And that again gives you a diagram and the morphism of diagrams. Okay. What do the unit and multiplication do? So the unit has to be a map from C, I mean the components of the unit, to diagrams in C. What does it do? It takes an object of C and gives this diagram. Here's the terminal category. Here's the functor picking out the object C, that's the unit. So that's the one object diagram. That's probably not so surprising. How about the multiplication? That's more interesting. So multiplication, we'll go to diagrams of diagrams in C to just diagrams in C. So what is the diagrams of diagrams? Let me maybe make the first lemma, that's not really lemma, more like a fact. So diagrams of diagrams are lax cocones. So here's an idea. We have to go from I, there's a diagram here to, that goes into the ag of C. Okay? So we have objects. Let me change color. I, small i. I prime, so that's a piece of the category I. This will go to some diagrams. You see, what is that? That's going to be some D I, let me say, it corresponds to D zero I, so a small category. Together with a functor, let me call it D one I, from this small category to C. So that's the first diagram. Same down here, D zero I prime, one I prime and then the map I will have to go to a functor here so D0 small i and the natural transformation here D1 small i and you don't just do this for one morphism of I you do for everything so you see you get a lax cocone with tip C over the diagram that's indexed by the part on category, the object part of this assignment here. Okay, so D is something like correspond of like D0, D1, where D0 goes from I to cat, which we imagine embedded into cat. And D1 is a cocoon, goes from D0 to just a constant diagram at C, but lacks. Okay. Now, how do we get from a diagram of diagram, just one diagram? And the answer is with the growth and deconstruction. 
So here's another very categorical sentence that I wish I had known before. So not only diagrams form a monad, but the multiplication is given by the growth in the construction. How does that work? Let me maybe copy this. So we have, let me make this also a bit larger. So we have a diagram of diagrams. And you probably know that the growth in the construction represents Laxco cones. It's like the, the Laxco limit or op in op Laxco limit. And I've called it the op Laxco limit. So you have this D0 that's a, a functor from I to cat. We can take its growth in the construction. So let me write G for growth in the construction because I will use the integral for coens later. So here there's G of D0. And it's such that these, these triangles here will commute and this two cell will restrict to a two cell in Q, right? It's just like a co-limit, but it's lax. Or, I mean, you get them like an op-lax natural transformation. So some sources like the NLAB prefer to call it the op-lax two co-limits. So the growth and deconstruction is a, uh, limit of the diagram. Now, since J, uh, sorry, I is small, and this is a, a functor landing in small categories, the growth in the construction is small too. So we have a small diagram into C. Let me call this mu of D, okay? And so we have a well-defined diagram in C indexed by a small category. That's the multiplication of the monad. If you want a more, a more hands-on way to see this, so the idea is that we have some category here, I, uh, sorry, DI, that this picks out some diagram in C, another category here that picks out some diagram in C again, and you have a functor between them that may, for example, identify these two things, but not these two things. And here this gives this natural transformation that does pretty much the same. So this goes here, this goes here. Now you see that's the same thing as a diagram that's indexed by the disjoint union of all these objects. The disjoint union of all those arrow and some additional arrows that come from whatever arrows there were here as at the functor level, which are these yellow arrows. That's why a bunch of diagrams in C with these natural transformations are going to have the same graph basically as one single diagram indexed by the growth and deconstruction. Where of course here in the growth and deconstruction, all these morphisms have the same rights. So they're not distinguishable anymore. So the yellow morphisms are the ones that come from like horizontal morphisms and the, the white morphisms are the one that come from the fibers. Uh, the curtain deconstruction will have both as morphisms. As diagrams of diagrams, they may be different. That's what's happening. All right, uh, so that's, you can prove that dike, mu, and eta as defined is a monad. on cat. Well, pseudomonad, okay? So naturality is strict, at least the way I've constructed it. The unit and multiplications are like, diagrams do not hold on the nose, they hold up to uh, some isomorphism, but this isomorphism is coherent by the fact that they are obtained by universal property. That's pretty standard set. So. The, all these things are unique up to unique isomorphism and so on. In the end, you still get a pseudomonad, okay? I can expand on this if there is interest. Okay, so the first statement is co-complete diagrams, uh, co-complete categories, sorry. Our algebras. 
Now, by co-complete, I mean small co-complete, I mean that has have small co-limits, locally small categories. Okay, because I don't want just posats, but I also don't want to break the whole theory. Okay. What do I mean by this? Of course not. Uh, so we have a category C. So C, locally small co-complete. And then we have a, a map from like diag of C to just C. Let me just call it co-limit. Of course, co-limits define the thing up to an isomorphism. So what you really need here is a choice of a co-limit for each diagram, okay? But yeah, of course that depends a little bit on how you want to, how you want your foundations to be. So technically this is a choice of a co-limit for each diagram. Doesn't have to be any coherence choice as long as your diagram, as long as your choice does satisfy the universal property of co-limit because then it's going to be a pseudo-algebra again and the higher coherences will hold by the universal properties. So what it means basically is that, first of all, if you pick out the one object diagram, then its co-limit is again the same object. So again, up to isomorphism. And for the multiplication square, maybe that's a little bit more interested and interesting. It's a kind of generalized Fubini theorem. So uh, Walter Tolan calls it the twisted Fubini theorem. So it's like not just the uh, co-limits over some product category, but uh, over some kind of index category. So here you can have new, here you can have the colim, and here you would have diag applied to colim, which remember diag, diag applied to something is just post composition. So that's call them post compose. And turns out that these things are isomorphic. And the reason to see that is that if you have a diagram of diagrams, which is the same thing as something down here in C, um, let's do it like this. May have a make this. Then what you can do is either post compose with the colimits, which means take just the colimit of the sub diagrams. So take the colimit here, the colimit down here, you get a new diagram, and then take the resulting colimit. Or you can take the colimit of the whole thing all at once. And by the universal property of colimits, these two things will be isomorphic, even uniquely isomorphic. So the uniqueness will give us a higher coherence. Okay, so this statement is known, it appeared under different guises in the literature. There's many proofs that one can do. So I was, uh, I was notified by a proof given by uh, Walter on this, uh, and sometimes called the colimit, the composition formula. And related statement is the twisted or generalized Fubini, of course, for co-limits or coens if you want. Okay. So here's another very category theoretical statement. The co-complete categories are algebras of the diagram, uh, the monad of diagrams. Now these are not all the algebras, okay? Uh, there's more algebras than these. So if you see the multiplication is more like a lax co-limit. So I haven't characterized all the algebras, pseudo algebras of this monad. I suspect that maybe lax co-complete categories are algebras in some sense, but uh, I was not able to characterize or at least I haven't done it yet. I also don't believe that this monad is KZ, like a Koch-Zilber line. 
I don't think so, but again, I haven't figured it out. It's like more lax than that. Okay. But anyway, all co-complete categories with this choice pulling with our algebras. So let's now have the first main statement. Theorem one. Let's instance partial evaluations for this monad and these algebras. So S C B uh, locally small co-complete categories, which we know this is Dyag algebra. So let me instance the definition of partial evaluation. So let this and J be well small diagrams. Now we have two forms of this theorem, a weak form and a strong form. Let me first say the weak form We have that D and E are connected by a partial evaluation. So when I in diag, diag, see, if and only if they sit in a diagram, so we have I, we have J. So this is D, this is E, this is C. Where G is a functor exhibiting E as left can extension of G along E and G is a split up vibration. So in other words, the diagram E is a partial co-limit of the diagram E for this monad that we have just said, if and only if E is the left can extension of D along a split up vibration, okay? Now this can extension is necessarily point-wise because I and J are small and C is co-complete, okay? So partial co-limits, are in some sense can extensions along split up vibrations. There is also a strong form there is actually a bijection between split up vibrations G as above, so exhibiting the can extension and partial evaluations. So it's not just an equivalence of properties, but it's actually an equivalence of structures, okay? Let's see the sketch of the proof. Sketch of the proof is going to be that, well, let's maybe go back here. To this situation. So we had 
this i that was indexed by and you see that this is a growth in the construction of this diagram so the category g of d0 is actually fibered over i and since we had a fun uh, if we have this diagram from i into cat this is not just any vibration, but it's a split one because this is an actual functor. Okay. And now, what it remains to be proven is that if you have some functor here and some hunter here, then the left can extension of F along G usually is what? Usually, so let's say applied to some I in here, usually is the collimate of the following functor. So we have C, we have F, we have this, let me call this A, And you have to take a slice category. So you have to take G over I with the forgetful functor to A. Okay, so that does the following thing. You have some A and some map from G A to your I. That's forgotten to A. And then that goes to F of A. However, for split up vibrations, the inclusion G minus one of I. So this thing. Is co-final. So this is just the A such that G A equals I, I mean by the identity. This thing is co-final. And so we can equivalently just take the co-limit over the fibers. So basically what we're doing is exactly what we were doing here. If you saw, I was cheating. So this diagram that I've given you is actually an up vibration. It's a split one. So you can equivalently take the co-limit over just the fibers of this map. And that's what's going to give you your left-hand extension. So that works because here we have a split up vibration. And that's roughly the proof of our theory. All right. That's about the monads of diagrams. Let's now talk about the image presheaves. So we have an assignment that goes as follows. Given a diagram in C, so C locally small, not, to, not necessarily completely yet, that I call image because it reminds me a little bit of the image measure of a random variables. If this construction is known and has another name, please let me know. This can be given in two ways. So either you have this diagram and you map it into the following free co-limit of the diagram. Or equivalently, You take the constant presheaf at one and you take just the can extension here. Okay. So you can also see in the weighted case, you have to replace 
one by some way. So you can also talk, do, do all of this with weighted diagrams. Uh, technically, it's kind of the same. Okay, and that's where, where you make the replacements. All right? Now, we call a small presheaf is a presheaf horizon this way. So it's an image presheaf of a small diagram. Equivalently, that's the same thing as a small collimit of representables. You can see it from up here. So this would be representables and you take a small collimit of that because I is required to be small, okay? Now, denote PC, the subcategory of presheaves that has small presheaves. Turns out that P is a monad. So for those of you who know this, you probably know that uh, the presheaves are like the free co-completion of a category, but they are the free large co-completion of a category. So you don't have an actual monad. However, usually when you, when you in practice want to work with a co-complete category, which is not a posat, you don't want all large co-limits. You don't want to like take the co-limit of all your objects of your category, for example, but you want Small co-limits, okay? You want maybe a locally small categories with small co-limits, such as set. And so you do get a monad and you do get an adjunction, but you have to restrict just the small presheaves, okay? So it's not all presheaves, just the ones that would give you the small co-completion. Now, for those of you that instead of knowing category theory like me, know probability monads better, I want to argue that P is, I would say, the Giri monad in disguise. Of course, also the converse is possible. The Giri monad is this monad in disguise if you prefer category theory. The idea is that of course the unit is just a unit embedding. I mean, obviously the representable functors are small co-limits of representable functors. More interestingly, the multiplication So you take a presheaf over presheafs. And you get this presheaf that takes an, an object C and maps it to a set. Which set? Well, you take P of C times phi of P. And you see now phi is contravariant. This is covariant, so this is a nice bifunctor, and you take the coand here where P is in PC. So compare with the multiplication of the Judy monad. Algebras are again co-complete categories. With now a choice of co end. So you have PC to C. So what's the idea? If you have some P from C off to set, small, and this is mapped to the following object of C, you have C times where this is the power or like tensor in the sense of co-limit times P of C. Compare with integration for the algebras of the jury monad. Okay. So that's like a probability monad and no co-limits are. Now how can you be sure that the co-end exists if C is large? I mean, 
because P, sure, yeah, that's a good, that's a good question because P is mm -hmm. small. So you can always find the diagram. Actually, I think what I'm going to explain in a moment may already answer your question. Mm -hmm. So whenever two monads have the same algebras or at least a subset of algebras, then you suspect there's a morphism of monads. So here are some lemmas. M is a morphism of monads. So, okay, maybe I don't have time to answer that, but the, the, the reason you can see that is that if you plus this co-limit here or this kind of extension as a co-end, then you can plug it in here for P. And then you can use the co unit dilemma and express that just as a small category. Maybe, let, me, let me just do that. EM is a morphism of monad. So what I want to say is that if you have diagraph C, you can go to M to PC, and then co-end to C or the co-limit. This commutes up to isomorphism. So what's happening here? So every, in particular, every P algebra is a diagonal algebra. So what's happening here is that you have, you start with I, D to C, and then you take the following thing. You take the integral so that's the co-end of C times, and P of C is going to be the co-limit, the, the free co-limit. So that's going to be this. So not of D of I, but of hum D I, okay? But that's the same thing as, I mean, if you want this Fubini, Uh, here there's a C, of course. Yeah. Then you can apply the co-unit dilemma. So this thing is the same as DI. So that's a co-limit. Just DI mm. and I is small. So the, the co-limit exists and it makes this diagram commute up to isomorphism, which is coherent, you get a morphism. Second, uh, second lemma that we have is obviously M is, a is essentially surjective because P, so P is basically defined to be the full image of this function. What is true is what, what about the converse? So how, how is this not injective up to isomorphisms where the following are equivalent for these two things, J, E. First is that they have the same image. The second is for every, for every functor like this, then the co-limit of F compose D is the same as the co-limit of F compose E. So N3, there exists a zigzag of co-final functors connecting I and J over C indexed by small categories. So let me call these things mutually cofinal. This generalizes the idea of cofinal functor. So having the same image per sheaf is way more than having the same colimits. It's like having the same colimits for all colimits that go through these diagrams. Okay? Just like when these differ by a cofinal functor. And they have the same image per sheaf if and only if this happens. Third lemma, then this last technical statement, then I go to conclude. So, so 
So here you can take M, here we can take M, here we can take M post compose, and here you can take P of M. This is pseudo natural. Now we know that this is essentially subjective on objects, but it's not split, okay? It's not split because of a size issue, which is rather annoying. However, we can prove that this is ISO2. And so the resulting M M is essentially subjective on objects as well. That's hard to prove. because we have to avoid size issues. Okay, all right. So let me come to the theorem two. So let's look at partial evaluations for this monad. So the one that's really of cool limits, not just of diagrams. Here we just have a weak form, not a strong form. Okay, so let P and Q be small presheets. or C uh, E algebra. So locally small category, uh, Kogum Pit category. Then there exists a partial evaluation. Let's me call it R in, no, I called it phi like that, phi in P, P, C such that connects P and Q. If and only if, there exists a can extension now not necessarily along a split of probation, but we want it pointwise. such that the image pre sheaf of F is P and the image pre sheaf of the cat extension, you know, of the isomorphism is Q. In other words, Q is a partial co-limit of P if and only if they are image perceives of diagrams sitting in a can extension. And that's the last thing I wanted to prove. So why do I care so much about this? Well, the thing is if you do probability you can replace cat by say, in my case, complete metric spaces and P becomes the Kantorovich monad. And this statement is exactly the same, but here, instead of pre-sheaves, you get probability measures on an algebra, which is a convex space. Then there exists a partial evaluation like this, if and only if, Keep this diagram where here you put instead the conditional expectation. So where there exists a conditional expectation and instead of diagrams, you take random variables. So in other words, We have to prove that can extensions are to conditional expectation as coens 
R2 integrals. Meaning that you have something here, either a functor or a measurable function, you have something here, and you want to find some kind of best approximation than here, which is the best approximation for your possible context. For the context of co-limit, this gives you a kind of extension. For the context of probability, this gives you a conditional expectation. Of course, here the result used the theorem once. We had an additional monad, this one of diagrams, where we had even a stronger statement that we don't have here. And that prompts the question of whether we want to do that for probability as well. In other words, pre sheaves are two probability measures. No, well, let's say, let's say R2 diagrams, right? Pre sheaves are a bit less nice than diagrams. As probability measures, or let's say measures, are to what? So is there a monad? of random variables. I don't know. Or something closely related, or maybe something closely related to the moon. I don't know. So that's all I wanted to say. Let me end up with a corollary. So we say that can extensions are partial co-limits, and so All concepts are partial collisions. Thank you so much. I'll be there for questions. We still have some minutes. Okay. Thanks, Paolo, for a fascinating talk. Thank you. Um, you're getting applause in the comments too. Um, I'll go straight to questions. The, please, please write questions either, well, hopefully in Zoom, but also in the Zoom chat if you like, um, or, or raise your hand. Um, but just to go from questions from the beginning, um, early, so 15 minutes in the talk, Hendrik Boom asked, so was a morphism of diagrams itself a diagram? Uh, well, yes, yeah, but one has to be careful. So yes, but at a different level. So a morphism of diagrams is this kind of triangle, like lax triangle. So if you want that, so this triangle happens to C is in large categories, right? So that's a diagram in a non, so it's a diagram in, I don't know how to make it like in here, like in the category that contains even larger categories. So yes, up to size issues. Great. Um... Morgan, there's been a bit of discussion about this already, but Morgan asks, um, so you can apply Fubini, uh, Fubini when you're in pre sheaves over a non-small category, question mark. Uh, yeah, but you have to be careful that those things exist. So the, the, one of the, for example, in the proof of this lemma, that this thing is essentially surjective, for example, I have to take co-limits over large categories, but of course you don't know they exist. So there's a whole business of restricting those into a, a small subcategory that, I mean, maybe let's see, let's say this. So the idea is that if you have a diagram here, then you can take this, the image pre sheaves let's call it P. What you can do then, you can take the growth and deconstruction of this pre sheaf and this thing is now a large diagram in C. It has the same image pre-sheave, but it's large. So to prove that it has the same image pre-sheave, you first have to do some things. Uh, there's a thing called uh, the comprehension factorization that tells you that you're going to have a co-final functor like this. Sorry, it's not an embedding. And so you can restrict your co-limit just on I using the right uh, functor in here. And that way you can turn this into a small co-limit and do everything that way. But, but if you can do that, then yes. But, but you can't always do that, or at least not in an obvious way. 
I was not able to do this always, like systematically. And some of these things like require some, some real tricks. Um, Morgan gives, says thanks. And a follow-up question of his from slightly later in the talk, just said, well, not a follow-up, but another question. It says, I'm confused about how having a zigzag of cofinal functors can be as strong as cofinality. I would love some clarification about this relation. So I suppose here, right? Yeah, on that slide. Okay, so how does this work? Now, first of all, if there's such a zigzag of cofinal functors over C, like, then by cofinality, co the colimit over I is the same thing as the colimit over whatever category in the middle, which is the same as the colimit over J, right? So from three, two follows by the notion of cofinality. Okay, yeah, okay, thanks, that makes sense. From two to one, well, just take F to be the unit embedding. I mean, the, the unit of the moment. So the real work and the proof is going from one to three. And that's again done using this trick here. So you can also do this with J. And it turns out that they both factor through the growth and deconstruction then you can take their joint full image, which is going to be a small category, and these two functors go are going to be co-final. And that's okay, how that, you get the zigzag. I was going to ask a, a further question about how long the zigzags could be, and so that answers that preemptively of you can yeah. always construct one of length two, basically. One okay, of length two, yeah. And uh, ideally, so this, uh, this growth is some some somehow terminal and all of those, the problem is that that thing is a large diagram, so you can't. If you allow for large diagrams, then it's, it's kind of obvious, but it, if you want small diagrams, then it's, you have to do the strict of just always restricting to the image. But yeah, these are, these are good questions. Thanks. Cool. So Fosco on the Azula track, sorry, in the Zoom has just asked, Khan extensions are co-limits weighted over representable profunctors. In this sense, Khan extending f along g is like co-limiting f conditionally to g. When g is terminal, this condition is vacuous. Is this a correct analogy? I suspect so. I, I, yeah, I would have liked to actually prove this formally, and I, I haven't done it, or maybe I wasn't able. I have yeah, that's... an idea to prove it. So if you want, we can think about it. Absolutely, yeah, let's talk about it then. <laughs> at some point. Yeah, yeah, so the, the way you prove the, the probabilistic statement is exactly by using conditionals. So, mm. so yeah, I, I actually was looking for a version of that for like, you know, stochastic maps are replaced by profunctors, like Kleisley functors. Yeah, I have thought so, for a so, while about that. So probably the two questions are tightly yeah. connected so, so. Uh, of course if you want a perfect analogy with probabilistic case you have you want to do all this for weighted diagrams yes yeah. that that plays the role of the measure space yes so, i have so tried this can be done for weighted things too can extensions look a bit more complicated but it yeah so we can do this i I'm, would be totally mm -hmm. interested in doing this yeah i i have tried to talk about this uh profunctorial look on stochastic maps with Daigil. So oh, probably he's interested too. Nice. Yeah. I mean, I would, I see, I see this more as a stochastic look on profunctors, but of course that's just personal. Yeah. That we, I am in the, on the, on the opposite side of the river, let's say. <laughs> great. great. Nice. Thank you. Very, Very interesting. Nice. Also, thanks for the talk. Oh, thank you. Great. Um, in terms of your question, Paolo, about the bar construction and yeah. partial evaluations. Oh, yeah. Emily Real has written on the Zulip oh, uh, uh, nice. comment, and um, Marty sort of Marty Carvonen has asked a for has made a comment, which is perhaps a follow-up question. But I, I'm not sure whether that's reading live worth reading live on air. But maybe something oh, to check out later. I can also read that on Zulip. Yeah, don't worry. <laughs> But, oh, thank you, thank you. Oh, uh, thanks. 
Great. Are there any further questions that people want to sort of shout out or, or write in the chats? It looks like not. So why don't we, we thank Paolo once again and then move to a more informal coffee discussion. Sure. So thanks again, Paolo. Thank you. Thank you.